So good morning, everyone. In recent years, both researchers and members of the Yakuk have encountered challenges related to the analysis and procedures for studying laboratory animal models. Uh, this is a very huge challenge for everyone. These challenges are reflected in the completion of forms, the, all the uh, institutional animal uh, care and use committee have this problem with filling out the protocols and having, having accurate information. And the best, uh, with regard to the, all the investigators that send information to the ACU in order to evaluate those protocols. Also, join the interaction of the implementations of the three R's. Everyone knows of the three R's, which is a replacement, refinement, and reduction, scientific rec rig rigor, and animal welfare to achieve better welfare and researcher outcomes and research outcome. This is very important. On June 2021, the National Institutes of Health Advisory Committee reported some important recommendations for the training and practice in statistics of researchers. That is why today we have invited Dr. Penelope Reynolds to talk about one of her several publications, Statistics and Statistical Thinking and the ACUC. Dr. Reynolds is an assistant professor of the University of Florida College of Medicine, Department of Anesthesiology, and the College of Veterinary Medicine, Department of Small Animal Clinical Science. She's also a member of University of Florida, Yakuk. Dr. Reynolds earned her Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology and Master of Science in Zoology at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. I love that. She also received her <laughs> Master of Science in Biometry and doc Doctor of Philosophy in Zoology and in Statistics at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Dr. Reino, I, I admire because statistics is not my content. I don't like statistics. So I admire with the, regard to that. Please welcome Dr. Reynolds. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very pleased and proud to uh, have been invited and I hope I'll change some of your minds about not liking statistics. Okay, so uh, as Dr. Rios said, this is based on a paper that I wrote um, last year that came out in Lab Animals. So I just provided the link in case you're not familiar with it. But most of the talk, spoiler alert, is going to be based on this paper. So I'm going to briefly go over the rationale why I was impelled to write the paper. Then I'll spend most of the talk um, teaching you the elements of thinking like a statistician. And it's what I call the statistical process principles. And then I'll finally conclude with a few practical applications, which you can use not only for um, developing a research program, but also for reviewing IACUC protocols. So as Dr. Rios said, in June, almost to the day last year, uh, the advisory committee to the director of the National Institute of Health came out with a report on what we need to do to improve the quality of animal-based research. And although their message was fairly muted, it wasn't nearly as strong as I would have liked. Nevertheless, there are two messages that came out. The quality of animal-based research is poor. And secondly, that what researchers understand and how they're trained in basic statistics and st statistical concepts is also very poor. So that's not good because that implies, almost without saying, that if the quality of animal-based research is that bad, then there's really an ethical problem in continuing to do research which wastes hundreds of millions of animals every year in research, which isn't just going to, isn't going to go anywhere. So they did conclude with saying that statistics isn't just a frill that you tack on to the end. It needs, all animal research needs good design, data analysis and results reporting that are clear, transparent, accurate, and the highest quality 
um, possible because without them, even the best animal models are useless. So it doesn't matter what a genius researcher you might be, if you don't have the fundamentals in place, the research is not informative. Now, the report also recommended that IACUCs could do a lot more to be gatekeepers. So I mean, the idea is that we see research at the source. So obviously we can go a long way to make it better quality. But there are two major objective, uh, objections to this coming from both investigators and from IACUC reviewers. Um, investigators usually say, no, that's none of our business. It's not our lane. It's not our call to do that. And secondly, and as Dr. Rios identified, very few IACUC members actually have training that's adequate enough to be able to assess the statistical aspects. Now, as far as it not being any of our business, oh, well, yes, it totally is. Um, it's part of our duty of care. Remember the three R's, that is the guiding principle for all of animal research. Now, unfortunately, part of the problem is that we have a very two-dimensional concept of what benefits and harms are. Um, animal uh, veterinarians usually assess the extent of animal suffering. Investigators um, boast and self-report just how terrific their research is going to be and how it's going to benefit all of humankind. And the IACUC, in some cases, is expected to rubber stamp the research as a result. So that's a very limited view. But in um, about 1986, so almost 40 years ago now, um, Peter Bateson added a third dimension, which is study quality. This is called Bates, Bates, Bateson's Cube. So if the propensity for animal suffering is very high, it doesn't matter how good the research is or how much it's likely to benefit humans, we should not allow it. Secondly, if the likelihood of benefit is low and the uh, amount of animal suffering involved is low, well, then it should be permissible. But with study quality as a third dimension, here, if the quality is high and animal suffering is low, it doesn't matter what the likelihood of benefit is, that may not even be um, identifiable at all. We should have extra grounds for approving the research or not. The second aspect is a little more troubling and that's because um, most investigators and very few IACUC reviewers actually understand what statistical thinking is involved. And there's, there's three myths which all feed into this idea that statistics is so hard, I hate it, I'm not going to do it. Number one is that statistics is just analysis. The second myth is that statistics is all computations and mathematics and therefore it's just too hard or it's really dependent on how much software you have. And then there's the third myth, which I've had, um, when I do consulting, I've had researchers actually have expressed both of these ideas in practically the same breath. It's so easy, anybody can do it because after all, we've got software or it's magic. So all of these are totally wrong. However, the implications also feed into the reason why a lot of animal research is so poor. And that's because we focus on all of these aspects that go into the maths and the analysis, all this really complicated stuff. From that, people have got the idea that there's only two outcomes you get, that you get a p-value greater than five, which is bad, or p-value less than 5%, which is good, Investigators have it as part of their belief system that if you have statistical significance, then it must be true. And that leads into a whole gamut of questionable research practices to get that elusive P less than 0.05. Selective publication, cherry picking, hypothesizing after the data are collected, chasing after P values and P hacking. That's a whole lecture on its own. I'm not gonna go into it here. It's just to say that this very limited idea of thinking of statistics is solely due to analysis and getting and statistical significance testing has really, really crippled animal research. So now I'm gonna spend the bulk of the talk teaching you how to think like a statistician. I'm not going to teach you about statistics. I'm going to teach you about the thinking process. The first take home, which I want you to have right now, is that statistics is not a thing, it's a process. And like any process, if there's mistakes or missing elements or just 
bad things happen in the early stages, that's going to cascade down to the later stages. So problems and good planning and good study design have to be built in early before the data are even collected. Because if that is not in place, that's going to affect what data are collected and how they're collected, how much bias is incorporated. And then all the fancy analyses in the world won't be able to rescue it. I can't perform miracles. If I have a bad shoddy database, which was collected using shoddy methods and just ignorance of a basic good practice, I can't rescue it. And those animals are wasted. So the second big take home is that you have to learn how to operationalize the statistical fundamentals. Now, this is a bit different from the paper because I was, of course, restricted by space limitations. So this is an extra component which you may not have seen before. The first thing is that you have to identify the research question. Then the three simple metrics for the use of IACUC and for the use of reviewers is identifying the outcome variables, identifying the study ba design basics, and then third, figuring out the animal numbers or assessing the animal numbers. So the first step is to break down the research question into its basic components. And this is borrowed from the uh, human clinical research arena. It's the PICO acronym, P standing for participants or patients or study population. I is the intervention. C, the comparators of controls. O is the outcome and T is your timeline. So PICO. So, what it is, is that identifies all the elements in the cause and effect diagram, because that's why we do experiments. You have causes, what you're being manipulated, what is being manipulated, the interventions, the controls. We're testing them on a platform, which is the animal itself. And then we measure the effects, the outcomes. So who does what to what and what happens? And of course, we have to define the time period because obviously we can't go on forever. And also the, time, the amount of time that something is measured may affect how it's expressed. So this was in the paper. Um, it was a research question, which is a, a real research question by a, a protocol that we actually reviewed. So an investigator wanted to study the effects of a new drug on uh, client-owned dogs to see whether or not it improved their motor function. And these dogs all had fairly severe osteoarthritis. So the dogs were going to be trained to walk on a leash and walk on a treadmill. And they spent about a week of habituating them to that. And then they took various measurements on motor function once a week for three weeks. So the efficacy of the, of the drug was going to be assessed by a change in their motor function scores at the end of the three weeks compared to how the dogs presented at baseline. So let's break the research question down into its components. Study the P, study population, client owned dogs, that's easy. The intervention is the new drug. The comparator is the baseline assessment where it's because we're doing a before after comparison. Outcome is motor function. And the time frame is the habituation plus the three weeks, so one month. The problem we have here is what is motor function. So this is what you need to watch out for um, in protocols is that you've got an outcome which is vague, it can't be measured or it's undefined. So there's all these waffle words that people use like survival or function or better and improved. Well, those don't have any meaning whatsoever. They have to be specific. They have to be quantifiable and they have to be measurable. So these are what outcomes are. These are the things that you measure to answer the research question. The, the outcome, the primary outcome is what drives your sample size calculations because that's what the study is supposed to be powered off of. And they also determine the methods. So that's why you have to know what's being measured, what the measurement units are, and how often it will be measured, the frequency of measurements. So let's go back to motor function. How is it defined? Well, when the investigator was tasked with this, they identified three separate things they were going to measure. Step length during walk trot, the range of motion of the hip joint, and the average limb peak vertical force. So those are things, and then they can describe what the methods were. Um, they needed a treadmill, they needed some force plate measurements, they needed a goniometer to measure the range of motion of the hip. But then they also said they wanted to measure the peak tetanic force of the isolated soleus muscle. 
Well, that's a question and that should be a red flag for the IACARP because how do you measure that? Are you going to kill the dogs? Are you going to extract the whole muscle? Are you going to use the biopsy? That's invasive. So that's all stuff that you need to know for proper assessment. Mm -hmm. Number two item is the study design. Now, this is where um, the not in your lane folks get hung up because they're usually confusing study design with technical study design, which is something that I hook can suggest, but we certainly can't mandate. And that's just the techniques and the methods and materials that the um, investigator is planning to use. What I'm talking about here is what a statistician talks about as statistical study design. That's the independent or predictive variables that are hypothesized to affect the response and how they are structured. Now, study, statistical study design is rarely, if ever, taught in the United States. It um, tends to be a feature of agricultural research programs, but it's certainly not in the basic sciences or in um, biomedical sciences. And that's really a pity because most of the uh, principles have been around for about 100 years, so you'd think that we'd have the chance to catch up by now. And what a good study design does, of course, is maximize the experimental signal to the amount of variability in the system so you can be sure of uh, getting um, a clean result with the minimum expenditure of resources in animals. I can't go into all the details of study design. That's uh, a study that takes years and years and is, would take hours to talk about. But there's three elements of the study design that everybody should know about. And that is the experimental unit, the number of groups, what controls are being used. And they don't, controls don't have to be a group. It can be just a level, like a before or after a condition. And then finally, the ethical oversight query. Do you, does the investigator really need the number of groups that they claim they do and can they be reduced? Now, experimental unit, again, is that's another one of these concepts which is virtually unknown to many investigators, but it's absolutely fundamental to not only to proper study design, but also to um, statistical inference. If you're planning to use hypothesis tests, you've got to know what an experimental unit is. It's defined as the entity that's subjected to an intervention independently of all other units so that it's possible to assign any two units to two different treatment groups. Now that's a bit confusing definition. It's the best one out there, but I'll show you by a couple of examples what we're talking about here. This is what most people think of, is that it's usually going to be the whole animal. So here it's quite straightforward. You've got two treatments. Mouse, the blue mouse gets treatment A and the black mouse gets treatment B. You, the experimental unit is the mouse and you've got four mice per group. Now, more conscientious um, investigators will, of course, keep their animals socially housed, which is best practice care, and they will mark the animals so they can identify which animal gets which treatment. So again, they've got two treatments. The experimental unit is still the mouse, but now they can introduce what's called a block or a cage effect to minimize the variation that's caused by different uh, microbiomes and cage effects and that sort of thing. So you still have four mice per group. Unfortunately, this is the most common sort of setup is that investigators either don't know or they're too lazy to individually mark their animals. And so everybody in the same cage gets the same treatment. So here they think they've got eight per group, but in fact, they don't. The experimental unit is the cage because that is the entity that's getting the single treatment. So what they really have is two per group, not eight per group. And if this is mistakenly um, analyzed as all of these mice being independent experimental units, you're going to get overinflation of the type one error, which is jargon for saying you're going to get a lot of false positives. There's also, it's also important when um, multiple measurements are being considered, you can have multiple measurements on a single sample. So here's your experimental unit. You take one sample from it and you split that sample into three. You can take multiple subsamples on the same experimental unit, like in um, plating assays, so extract the bone marrow, um, do it in three to get a an estimate of the measurement error. And then of course there's repeated measures where you take 
um, sequential measurements on the same experimental unit. All of these have to be incorporated in the study design. How many groups? Um, when you're reviewing a protocol, what you really need to look out for is you do the simple math and how many groups they claim they need and just see if the numbers will generate a really large sprawling experiment with unfeasibly large numbers of groups. Or if they have a lot of extra control groups, uh, which are really redundant. For example, a lot of people will like to design a study with one wild type control and one knockout control, but then they're repeating it over multiple, multiple groups. You don't always need wild uh, type controls for everything. You can really cut down on the number of animals by careful consideration of control groups. So this is another example, again, a real one. An investigator wanted to assess the effects of four doses of three drugs in a mouse model, which consisted of two wild type and two knockout strains. Uh, the animals were going to be tested in a series of behavioral um, assays, and then the animals would be euthanized and the tissues harvested at three time points. So they have two outcomes, gene expression and the animal behavior. So you do the simple math, four strains times three drugs times four doses times three time points, that's 144 groups. So, so even if you have only five animals per group, that's still getting up to almost 800 animals and 10 per group is well over 1,000, almost 1,500. So you need to ask yourself, you do the simple math and then ask, is that feasible? If they've only got two technicians, it probably won't be. For something like gene expression, it might be because you may need that amount of tissue in order to run those assays, but you need to ask yourself, are the numbers per group really necessary? And um, again, with a very large number of groups, it's really difficult to um, interpret the results after, as a result of the statistical analyses. And again, you're liable to false positives. For behavioral assays, it's highly unlikely they could even hope to process that many thousands of animals. It's just ridiculous. And then finally, number three is animal numbers. Um, NIH, and of course, the uh, constraints of the three R's, says we really need to focus on animal numbers, proper justification. That is also the um, number one item for reproducibility. And this is because the correct number of animals is important to right size the experiment. You have to have enough animals to properly address the research question and get meaningful answers out of it. But you don't want to have so many that they're wasted. And I might remind you that underpowered studies of too small sample size are wasting all of the animals. So just a small sample size itself does not guarantee that animals are not being wasted. If the numbers are not sufficient to address the research question, all of the animals are being wasted, not some of them. Uh, number two, the three R's are the guiding principle for animal-based research. We have to ensure that minimal harm is done for maximum scientific value. So using more animals than necessary, and especially if the research is not informative and poor quality to begin with, is just unethical. So when reviewing a, a protocol in particular, uh, don't rely on what the researcher has told you about their power calculations. Um, most of the time, see, I've reviewed literally hundreds, if not into close to a thousand protocols with very, very few exceptions. They're usually incorrect. They're usually completely inappropriate. Like they're using a power test for a T test, uh, two sample T test, but they're planning to do an experiment with five groups or else they'll just play with the uh, calculations so they can get their favorite number. Six is the number of animals we've always used in our experiments. This is what we've published before. Or based on our experience, no, don't allow those excuses. They have to show their work for what the research question is for the protocol that they're presenting now. So the justification, um, criteria I gave in the paper are essentially three. Are the numbers verifiable? So does the investigator show their work? Do they provide scientific justification? Um, don't rely on just the usual statistical effect size. 
that can't be interpreted. It's not meaningful. Don't rely on the author tell, or the researcher telling you, well, in our experience, well, we don't know what their experience is. They have to show their work for the experiment that is being considered now because it's, it's a new experiment. Always, always, always ask if the numbers are even feasible. Now, we have, we have a, the, a person we call the Million Mouse Lady because she presented a serious protocol asking for a million mice. I'm not, and that is no exaggeration, for a three-year protocol with only two technicians. I mean, it's just silly. And she got really quite angry when we told her that she had to um, replan her experiments. However, my favorite of all time was an investigator who requested 91,385,777 mice for a three-year protocol. And um, no, again, he got very angry when we said this was just preposterous. So always check, do they have the money, the time, the resources to accomplish what they want to do? And if you've got these preposterous numbers, then send it back to them. They've got to plan this. The IACUC is not just a wish list of things they want to do. It's a blueprint of a plan. And in some cases, it's even a legally binding contract with the university. And then finally, it's got to be ethical. Remember the three R's. It's got to be appropriate for the study objectives. There has to be a reasonable number of groups and animals that can be processed in the time. But also make sure to check with um, animals that fall in what I call the negative spaces, like animals used for training or for breeding. There's going to be a lot of collateral losses, and they have to have a loss mitigation plan described. For example, um, some investigators wanted to develop this strain of knockout mice, which you can't buy commercially. It has to be developed, fair enough. They did their plans. They needed um, 150 mice for their experiments. Again, fair enough. But the number of heterozygotes and, um, and homozygotes that were not of the uh, genotype that they wanted were just going to be euthanized. And that worked out to be almost 1,800 animals. Well, that is not ethical. They have to come up with a, a plan to use those animals or rethink their entire experiment. And the same goes with training. A lot of training processes don't even need animals at all. And if you're trying to teach a student how to uh, suture, you can do it on a chicken leg. You can do it on a piece of cloth. You don't always need animals. So any sort of simulations or um, training um, um, surrogates can be used to um, to develop a skill set which don't need animals should always be used. So finally, the applications. Uh, we really have to change the culture. There's been too much of um, a, a thinking that it's okay to waste animals, especially rodents, because they're not covered by the Animal Welfare Act and they're just furry petri plates. No, we have to change the color culture completely. We have to minimize the animal suffering and we have to minimize waste by promoting quality research. So it means that people are going to have to change their behavior. We need to emphasize more principles of reproducibility and that gets into the whole notion of statistical thinking, which I have covered in this talk. So a couple of action plans. Number one, Start thinking statistics is a process, not a thing. Start building that into uh, research from the get-go. Number two, learn and apply those statistical thinking components and apply them to your protocol reviews. And it'll actually streamline the process quite a bit because you don't have to wade through all this verbiage of people boasting what they plan to do. You can actually identify what are the most salient features, the most important ones for assessment of ethical oversight. And finally, you have to be proactive. Um, do provide educational materials and instructions in all of these concepts. And at the end of, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I have a list, there's a supplementary list at the end of the paper. I'll provide them at the end of this talk. Because we have to realize that Statistics and statistical thinking isn't a frill, neither is fancy analyses, but that if experiments are poorly designed and statistics are misused, this is irresponsible, it's negligent, and it's ultimately unethical because animals are wasted and they are forced to suffer and we kill them in their thousands and millions. 
and their information is never used. But at the other end of the research pipeline, that humans are harmed and even killed because of um, research, which has gone to inform the design of human clinical trials, which have no basis in reality. And in fact, about 95 to 98% of animal trials never ever get translated to any sort of human intervention, even if they don't even proceed to phase one. So we have got to do better. And so finally, I provided a bunch of, of study planning resources of the Norway um, Ethical Oversight Group, NORCOPA, has got a huge checklist and um, explanatory documents. The best study design resource there is out there is the free experimental design um, assistant on the NC3R's website. There's technical resources also at that website, everything from bleeding animals to handling mice to um, care of primates, all sorts of things. Also pay, uh, good pain assessment scoring tools. And then finally, there's the ARRIVE 2.0 reporting guidelines for reporting animal research. And it also is a useful um, tool for planning research when you see what the essential elements are for good quality publication have to be built into the study beforehand. So that's all I have today. Thank you so much for your attention and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for uh, many useful information. I think this is a fantastic information uh, I wish help our Yakub member to be more thoughtful when we review all the application forms and, uh, and for the researchers. So I think that Susan Corey have a question. Go ahead, please. Oh uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I just have a question about the, um, if you have a recommendation for the calculation of the, uh, of the power analysis, or are you recommending that you not use power analysis, or are you just recommending saying that it's done poorly, or you want to recommend a particular program for doing that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what I'm saying is that in the IACUC protocols that we receive, they're usually not done right. <laughs> In fact, they're stupid most of the time. There are certainly for a definitive experiment, they, they really, and you're, when you're testing hypotheses and you're planning to use statistical inference, then they're indispensable. But you can't just like come up with this pre, um, push button thing and get some number out. It has to be, there has to be a thoughtful consideration of the study design. The best free resource out there is GPower. I mean, that's really excellent. It's easy to download and they've got a really good um, instruction manual which comes with it. The problem is, is that most people are lazy and they don't really read it thoroughly, nor do they take the time to, to actually assess what type of study design they actually have. And the G-Power folks make it very, very clear that you have to know that. So it's not just you know, downloading the, the power equation for a t-test. You have to think about all these other aspects. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll look at it. Thanks. Yeah, and yeah, so we do see a lot of uh, in the in the justification of animal numbers. We do see a lot of uh, not really very well explained uh, justifications for animal numbers. You and but we were told by um, by ALAC, I guess it was, that we needed to we needed to ask people to do the power analysis there. And you think that we should be asking even more, asking them to to provide the um, the basic of the of the, the basic data that they use for doing their power power analysis. Would that be what you would you would recommend? Absolutely, and and some some and some things don't. There was another paper I wrote too, which was in a rage because people were <laughs> trying to, they were, they were trying to do power analyses on everything. A power analysis is only useful if you're planning to actually test a hypothesis. So there's a lot of things which aren't testing hypotheses at all. Like for example, we had um, some veterinarians who wanted to do some a study on Maine coon cats, and they were they were looking at. Uh, 
animals that were homozygous recessive for a particular trait. So the question was, how many animals do we need to screen to be sure that we get at least five that are homozygous recessive? Well, that's not a power calculation. So that's that's a different that's a different skill set altogether. In fact, you know, I wrote I wrote them a little macro so that we could figure it out. Um, breeding, for example, um, that's just simple maths and some basic assumptions of Mendelian genetics. If you expect that it's homozygous recessive is going to be one quarter of pups, well then. What's the number, what's the average litter size? What, what proportion of pups can you expect will have that trait? How many do you expect to be homozygous lethal? And that's, that's just grade two arithmetic. That's not power calculations. So the, the justification for the numbers has to be tailored to, again, the research question and the objectives of the study. If it's not testing a hypothesis, then you don't use power calculations. You use maths and, Number one is feasibility. If you've got two technicians, one of whom is being trained, you cannot possibly expect to process one mouse every 10 seconds if the surgical procedures take 45 minutes. That's just stupid. So people who ask for tens of thousands of mice, just the, their protocol needs to be sent back and they need to have a proper plan. Yeah, let oh. me ask you another question on, on, the, on the breeding question. Uh, you said that you need to have a mitigation plan. Now we have had a mitigation plan, which was, well, we'll give them to uh, the, the excess animals that can't be used. Uh, we'll give them to people who, who need extra animals. Well, you never can find them. And so is there something, some other um, idea that you have for, um, for what to do with excess animals that in, in breeding when you're trying no. to get them? No, I don't. And this is this is a perennial problem. And we don't really know how what the extent of the waste is, because that, that sort of data is not is not um, collected. We know that there's a, a ton of waste that way. Um, now, some colleagues in my and I have been working on a, on a mouse breeding project, so we were able to track that within our, our subset within some of our colonies and it can be as much as 80 percent i mean that's really shocking because that, that those that sorts of numbers just never never get tabulated at all now in germany there um last week they actually said they're talking about making that a criminal offense it's waste i'm it. sorry making what making that sort of waste of lab animals a criminal offense oh oh <laughs> so we need to start thinking really long and hard about how animals are being used i think what what makes me really angry incredibly angry is people who say well i'll need 400 mice for this project uh, they breed them up, they waste 1,600 because they're not the correct genotype. And then you look at their three-year um, uh, summary of the animals they used, and they used 10. So all those other, so they just overbred, 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 and then they never use the animals. So that's just bad planning. <laughs> bad planning on the, on the researcher's part. That's not a statistical question. This is a planning problem. And we need to instruct our, our researchers more in the um, actual logistics of setting up a study. Because when you're, especially if you're breeding mice, it's not like turning on and off a tap. <laughs> you know, they start, start pumping out litters and you can't just stop them. They're just going to keep building up. And if the inventory gets up really high and you can't use them all in the time it takes to process them, it's waste. I mean, that's a that's a basic supply chain problem, which the economists have already worked out more or less, except now with COVID. <laughs> you see, see what I'm saying is that is that numbers is it's not just simply hypothesis testing at the end of the study. It it's all devolved into planning and logistics and having a, a good eye for not wasting animals and using just having what you can actually use. Uh, thank that you. Is, that is the most important thing that the researcher uh, be aware of the not, not wasting uh, animals and personnel and 
all different type of things and the, in the maintenance and the husbandry of the animals. That's very tough uh, with regard to some uh, researchers. I have Ricardo Gonzalez with uh, his raise hand. Ricardo? Cheers. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Reynolds. I really appreciate your talk. Uh, I teach a graduate level course for advanced graduate students in biomedical sciences on rigor and reproducibility of research. Yay. And you touch a very, very important point on um, the design. The course is based on design from lab techniques, techniques animal numbers, um, animal experiments, and the statistical design. Um, I wanted to ask you if you've done, seen that you've done something like this. My biggest frustration is the pushback of the PIs when the students develop models that say, don't do what you've done for 20 years with your animal models because you need to do a few more. So it becomes, as you were mentioning, the gaming of the, literally the gaming of the power analysis. And I have to literally arm wrestle with my students to get them to what's a reasonable number. And sometimes it's five or six. Sometimes it's eight or 10, but the PIs really push back on them to even when they do their projects for the course to actually put those numbers. Um, so could you share with me and with the group um, some of your experiences on this culture change? Because I can affect some of the many, and I have, I'm, it's, it's a real pleasure to see when they do their dissertation defense that they put the principles I taught them and some of us teach them, but sometimes it's really frustrating uh, to see um, their PI is trying to do what was done 20 or 30 years ago because they've never had a problem publishing. So if you could share some of your experiences and what's effective in terms of this culture change, I would really appreciate it. Well, you'll have to send me a wreath at the same time. Uh, <laughs> what they say, change only occurs one funeral at a time. So well, especially if it really depends on the person. I mean, some, some PIs are very proactive they're really interested in best practices and they're willing to learn and evolve. But unfortunately, um, the US academic system doesn't reward that. What it rewards is a lot of publications, grants, which have nothing to do with the quality of science necessarily. So until we get over that metric, and as Doug Altman said 25 years ago, we need less research, better research, and research that's more attuned to the actual research needs. But that's just not going to happen. So you're always going to get people gaming the system. What we can do uh, is that we've got to be more cognizant of the statistical tools that were put in place over 100 years ago, Hopper's ex uh, experimental design. Most people think that, um, that uh, animal experiments should be set up the same way as a human clinical trial. You've got two arms, so two, two comparison groups, you know, placebo and a treatment, and that's how they design all of their animal experiments. But that's just not true because in the 1920s, early 1930s, a whole battery of experimental designs were um, developed specifically to meet the needs of basic science, where you have multiple groups, small sample sizes, and you can rapidly screen a lot of uh, candidate um, interventions or drugs very rapidly and then converge to a target solution. And that's what's still being used today in industry and product quality control, but animal investigators don't know about that. Um, one of the, the best, most flexible designs is the factorial, where you design where you have, um, say, two levels, a small level and a large and the high setting of five different um, intervention factors. You can look at all of the interactions between them. So you can see if there's any synergisms or antagonisms. And it uses a quarter of the animals that a two arm study would use repeated multiple times for different candidate drugs. People just don't know about that, those classes of designs. So we have to somehow get the word out that there's better ways of doing something. 
And uh, the experimental design assistant is really good about that. It will, it will walk you through those processes of finding a design which is best suited for your needs. But a, a well-designed study can use a fraction of the animals that the conventional two group study will do. Thank you. No, I, I, I do take them through some of the more advanced designs and uh, the students are fascinated by what they can do. And again, it's like, oh, but we only, you know, I've done a three group analysis of variance type uh, design yeah. <laughs> for the last 20 years. And, then when you, and even the simple thing of saying, well, you then have you corrected for multiple comparisons and your p-value is no longer 0.05. And then you, you know, just let's go from the basic and build upwards to the more sophisticated. Oh, they get the, you know, they really push back on that. So, but I'm trying to work with the next generation and I do appreciate a lot of what you have shared today. Because it will be help firm, me my be course. firm. Oh, I am all the time. Thank you. Yes, I have Dr. Deepak Banerjee. Yeah, good morning. Hello. Hello, yeah, that nice uh, presentation. So I have, I play two roles and I use animal in my uh, experimental study, but I try to be very conservative. I don't want to use too many animals to get a, a, a reasonable data set and data point. So, but when I serve as a member of the IACU, I do see the investigators submitting their protocols. The first thing when I look at the animal table, it just immediately raises the red flag in my mind. Question is, do they really need those many animals? So when I bring it on the table for discussions, so obviously there was a, um, there are quite a bit of discussions and I said, we need to get back to the, send it back in a, in a, in a, in a fashion that the PI or the investigators can really redesign their, their experiments with a less number of animals, but with the best outcome they're, they're proposing that. So that's, you already covered that. That's very good in that respect. But my, uh, I'm, I'm just picking up another point you mentioned about the breeding colony, but you, you talked mostly about the rodents. We also have a, a monkey colony here in UPR, uh, in Puerto Rico, which is basically uh, by, by the University of Puerto Rico system that has it. So we have uh, two, one is SPF colony, and also we have for behavioral studies, many people from all over the or like many, many countries also they come and participate. But the problem comes is their growth, you know, their, their, that how do you control is very difficult. And, and so sometimes we have to take some actions in order to maintain the population up to a certain level. So, so that always brings a, uh, some sort of a discussions which not necessarily I agree, but what do you suggest in order to maintain a population within the um, sizable limit. Well, that's a systemic pro issue. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, that's, I can't just say off the top of my head, it depends on there's supply, there's demand, um, there's um, personnel to care for the animals, there's making sure they have the best possible quality life. <sighs> I, I really can't answer that. Yeah, no, I, but I think, I but I think if we focus more yeah, on very what's best for the animals rather than catering to every whim of investigators, we might be a little further ahead. And again, in Europe, they're, they're banning a lot of primate studies altogether. And I think it's about time. We don't really need them, maybe for a few things and only as a last resort. Like some of the neuro yeah, studies are pretty important. But I think if we start thinking about animals as being a last resort, you know, we have investigators. We, we have investigators uh, uh, coming from Europe to use our colony for their oh. studies. Oh, well, so are they? How interesting! Yeah. So we do we do review their protocols, and then based on that, yes, we said go ahead, or or based on that, they have to monitor things like that. But the the number of population, you know, the animal populations is trying to go out of hand. So we have it. That's a serious concern. We have. Um, in our committee and also at the, at the institutional level. Yeah. Well, with primates too, I mean, I'm not a primate expert by any means, but there's certainly much more of an effort now than there ever used to be to get them 
adopt it out or at least go to a refuge where at least they can spend some part of their life happy. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Torres. Dr. Torres. Thank you very much for uh, your lecture, Dr. Reynolds. Um, I would like to thank you on behalf of uh, Hispanic Alliance in Puerto Rico, specifically the TRCR at UCC, and uh, invite you to come over to Puerto Rico and uh, give us oh, a, yeah, a, I'd seminar, love to. <laughs> a seminar or workshop either, either at the medical center UPR or at UCC or at Ponce School of Medicine. So thank you again and thank you everybody for, uh, for your uh, attendance. Thank you very much.